My name is David Jacobs. I was sitting in the church one night. There weren't too many people there. I was sitting on the bench by myself. And this song came to me and I told the pastor, I believe the guys give me a song and this is how it goes. I was sitting on the banks of the old Satella, waiting for the fish to bite. I was reading my Bible, talking to Jesus, along came a filthy fly. He lit on my leg and lit on my arm and lit on top of my head. I was reading my Bible, talking to Jesus, wishing this fly was dead. Now the devil and fly is just alike, both will pasture you. So get your Bible and make up your mind, I'll tell you what to do. Make up your mind to stand for the right, turn your back on wrong. Through the trials and tribulations of your life, God will make you strong. If your load is heavy and your mind is black and you don't know what to do, take them to the altar and leave them there. Jesus will take care of you. The fight of faith that you must fight is not yours alone. It's the power of God to those that believe God will take you home. So ignore the devil and kill the fly and you will be free. God sent his only son to give you victory. You have to pray and you have to say the word of God alone. It's the power of God to those that believe God will take you home. I was sitting on the banks of the old Satella waiting for the fish to bite. I was reading my Bible talking to Jesus along came a filthy fly. He lit on my leg and lit on my arm and lit on top of my head. I was reading my Bible talking to Jesus wishing this fly was dead and I got him. Hallelujah.
Somewhere in the distance I heard the hammering As they drove the nails In his hands and in his feet As the crowd gathered round Sing away that he would live again. Oh, yeah. He has risen. He has risen. That open is empty now. All
Often my thoughts make me weep for so many now sleep in their graves near the old country church. And sometimes I may rest with my friends I love best in a grave near the old country church. Precious precious
When my Jesus I shall see When I look upon his face The one who saved me by his grace When he takes me by the hand And leads me through the promised land What a day, glorious day What a day, glorious day that will be. My name is David Jacobs. I was sitting in the church one night. There weren't too many people there. I was sitting on the bench by myself. And this song came to me, and I told the pastor, I believe the guys give me a song, and this is how it goes. I was sitting on the banks of the old Satella, waiting for the fish to bite. I was reading my Bible, talking to Jesus, along came a filthy fly. He lit on my leg and lit on my arm and lit on top of my head. I was reading my Bible, talking to Jesus, wishing this fly was dead. Now the devil and fly is just alike, both will pastor you. So get your Bible and make up your mind, I'll tell you what to do. Make up your mind to stand for the right, turn your back on right. Through the trials and tribulations of your life, God will make you strong. If your load is heavy and your mind is black and you don't know what to do, take them to the altar and leave them there. Jesus will take care of you. The fight of faith that you must fight is not yours alone. It's the power of God to those that believe God will take you home. So ignore the devil and kill the fly and you will be free. God sent his only son to give you victory. You have to pray and you have to say the word of God alone. It's the power of God to those that believe God will take you home. I was sitting on the banks of the old Satella waiting for the fish to bite. I was reading my Bible talking to Jesus along came a filthy fly. He lit on my leg and lit on my arm and lit on top. Right, welcome everyone. Let me loop word prayer and get started. Tomorrow I'll open it up. Uh, got a card to read. Says thank you. With warmest and deepest heartfelt thank you to our church family for the special calls, cards, text, and prayer during this time of recuperation. God blessed us as he guided the surgeon and set, set me on the path of healing with continued prayers. All will heal quickly and completely. God bless each of you, Michael and Caroline Hutt. They had some eye surgery. I talked to him today. He said it's better, but he... Still, kind of like what Robert just said, it, he could see outline, but it was fuzzy. So, got a ways to go on his. He got to have some more work later on, I think, what I understood. Homecoming April 3rd, no evening service. April 17th, Easter, no evening service, but we will have sunrise service at 7. Breaks will be served after service and we have our regular service at 11 that day if you know anyone that's graduating you need to know their name as quickly as possible got a bunch of names on our prayer listing on our bereave Lana Driggers Janie Gibson Olita Strickland, Tommy Vickers, Marilyn Martin, that's Clarissa's grandmother, Big Martin's mom, Jimmy White, that's James White boy, he used to live around here, Surgery, Brother Robert had it, he's here, said he's a little fuzzy, but he's a, told him he could drive, he just couldn't operate no heavy equipment, so we thank the Lord that things went well. Mike Hendricks had his, uh, yesterday, I hadn't heard from him. Doing good, okay. Wanda Hines, he's supposed to have a knee replacement tomorrow if nothing's changed. 
Hospital, Lily Cruz is still in Brunswick, as far as I know. Teresa John is in Waycross with pneumonia. Leah Birch is home. She needs prayers. Zeta still needs prayers. Bruce Wainwright, C. W. Lane, Carolyn Strickland, Walter Johns fractured his finger. Had to have it set. It kind of, kind of looked like it was bent this way. And uh, anyhow, they said it. Put a brace on it for right now for a week, and they have to check it again and see. If it's staying in place, if not, they'll have to operate on it. So remember him. Uh, C.W. Riggins home. Edward Brown fell, hurt his leg, having other problems too. Uh, Brenda Davis, Kendall's baby. That's a second cousin of mine's baby. Had a baby born premature and it's a down baby, so be in prayer for him. Ian Johns. Tanya Causey is home. Uh, Becky Lane take on her second round of treatments. Uh, Mike Keene is in St. Simon's on hospice at St. Simon. Prays for Chuck Allen and Mike Hack. Pray for the Ukraines. Daryl Dixon been in the Jessup Hospital. He moved to Savannah. And Tucky Hopper is out of the nursing home home. Anybody else we need to add or take away? Who? Ruthie? Ruthie? Yeah. She's already had the surgery. Ruthie Cruz had back surgery, and she's coming to, supposed to be coming to Bayview for rehab stage. Odie. Odie Cruz. Right out. Okay. I'll leave these up for you. Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight, Lord, just thanking you for the opportunity to be in your house for your people, Lord. You tell us to not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, as a matter of some is, but so much more as we see the day approaching. We exhort one another, encourage, lift up one another, Lord, as we see the latter days, Lord, we we're in some trying times, and, Lord, we ask that you just help us keep our eyes on you. And, Lord, we know you can steal the wind and the sea and the waves, and you can guide us through. And, Lord, we pray that you would. We pray for all of you, Lord, that names and that list grows and grows, Lord, and you know each and every one because nothing escapes you. And all-knowing, all-seeing God. And, Lord, we ask that you meet each need that was requested. We thank you for the ones you've already met. The praise, Lord, we just can't praise you enough for what you do for us. Salvation is the greatest gift of all, Lord, and we thank you most of all for it. But, Lord, we thank you for everyone that's here tonight, Lord, and we pray, Lord, that you'd just give Brother Jamie the word that you'd have us to hear, a word directly from you, Lord, use it with our mouthpiece. Lord, just help true pastors and true churches stand strong in this world and this time, Lord, uh, when our government and uh, everybody, it seems like, trying to make the truth a lie and a lie of truth, Lord, but help us not to fall for that and stand by your word which is truth. You are the truth, Lord. You're the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to follow but by you, and we thank you, Lord. Lord, we ask again that you just meet these needs in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. <laughs> you. We'll omit the song service. We don't have any music tonight, so... We'll get right into the Word of God. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Luke chapter 22. Not going to the rest of Gideon to, tonight, might be Sunday, but uh, as we're inching closer and closer to Easter, uh, we'll be good, probably staying close to the Scriptures as it comes up to the 
resurrection of Jesus Christ, but tonight is um, we study God's word and uh, what Luke has to say about what happened there at the end uh, when they had the Lord's Supper and, and when they were gathered, gathered together there. Uh, so if you would, uh, you found Luke 22. Stand as we read a couple of verses there as we honor the reading of his word. It says, Now the feast of the unleavened bread drew nigh, which is called the Passover. And the chief priests and scribes sought how they might kill him, talking about Jesus, for they feared the people. Father, we thank you again tonight for being with us, Lord, and allowing us to come into thy house, Lord. We just pray, Lord, that uh, all the names mentioned, all the, all the many ones, that, Lord, that's got things going on, Lord, you'd bless them in a mighty way. Help us tonight, Lord, as we expound upon the word, Lord, that we do nothing, but we'll be pleasing unto thee. Help us all, Lord, to love you more each day. And all God's people said, Amen. Look at the time and the setting this was. as It speaks of the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, uh, which is called the Passover. Uh, this is why the New Testament and the Old Testament are just equally important. Uh, because this event that it's talking about, that they celebrated on, it happened uh, back early in the, in the Old Testament as... Uh, God had led, was fixing to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. And this was the game changer that happened when the, when the uh, Lord had sent the, the death angel upon Egypt and, uh, on, and had, they had to protect the firstborn uh, of, of everything, not only just the children and in the families, but the, the animals, the firstborn of everything when it went through there. Uh, but those that had the lamb's blood on the door mantle and the doorpost, uh, it passed, the death angel passed over them and, and had no uh, hurt. Uh, no one died in that, in, under that roof. And uh, they celebrated that from um, since then, even in here. And it was that time of year, it's in the month of Nisan, as we, we look back in, uh, the, our, not our calendar, but, uh, but the Jewish calendar, and uh, which we usually falls between late March and early April for us when we celebrate um, Easter, which would be the resurrection time of the Lord Savior Jesus Christ. And so they were meeting here, and Christ is going to instruct them on some things, and some, some things happen at this particular time. Uh, we know there were 12 disciples gathered here with them, and um, we, we could say that uh, because that's what the Word of God says, but did we know that there one uh, there was, uh, he was, he was not uh, a true disciple of God. He was a true disciple of the, Lord, uh, the, of the devil. But it says in verse 2 there that the chief priest and the scribes saw how they might kill him, talking about Jesus, uh, how popular he was. But you see the politics involved. The reason why they were scared to openly arrest him and have him killed is because of the great following that Jesus had. Uh, and he really had done anything wrong but called them out on some of the things that they were doing wrong. Uh, they were using uh, their positions and all uh, kind of what, as I see it, uh, in, in our Congress up there, uh, they should be up there making only what we pay them to make and nothing more, nothing less uh, because it just kind of gets out of whack, but it's politics. So they wouldn't do that because they're afraid they hurt some people and there to be an overthrow in the government. Da, 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 da. But yet, why in the world did they have a heart to, to kill Jesus? Uh, for he didn't do anything but good. So but they sought to kill him. And it was getting time uh, for Christ to do this thing anyway. But in verse 3 it says this, Then Satan entered into Judas' uh, surname Iscariot, being of the number of the twelve. Uh, I, I kind of like the way that it reads there, being in the number of the twelve. Uh, you know, he, he was counted, there was twelve there, but, you know, we, we know... Uh, because we know the rest of the story, um, the twelfth one became Paul. Uh, Judas was never one. The Bible says he had never lost any, save one, the son of perdition, which means the son of Satan, never, which he never was. You can't be the son of God and the son of Satan at the same time. You one or the other, and he was the other. Uh, and, and ironically, uh, how that they put him in, in as treasurer of the group, uh, is kind of, uh, it makes sense today. That's why I think the scripture's in there. It's uh, 
the love of money is the root of all evil. Uh, he, he, when, when he, he actually he ever spoke up any to amount to anything other than where we're fixing to be, it was when um, they were trying to feed the 5,000 and 3,000 and trying to do good, and he didn't have the money to do this or that or the other. He was more concerned and, and, uh, the, about the waste of the uh, alabaster box. You kind of feel like he was in the mix of all that stuff. But anyway, uh, it says he was numbered with the 12. He said, and he went his way and communed with the chief priest and captains how he might betray him, Jesus, unto them. So he was... Uh, uh, he was drawn by Satan to do that. Satan had entered into him. He was drawn to them. He knew, Jesus knew, that they sought to kill him, and uh, Judas did too. So he wanted to find out how he could be benefited if he was part of aiding them and how to find a way to kill Jesus. And uh, so he went and communed with them. Uh, that's not a commune that you would like to do. We'd like to commune with the Lord, but we don't want to commune with the, uh, the adversaries, and that's who they were. Uh, he communed and conferred with them. And verse 5 says, And they were glad and coveted to give him money. They, they, they promised him money. So what was the, what was the uh, life of Jesus worth to this part, so-called called himself a, a, a disciple an apostle of the Lord, uh, what was more important? Money. Money, and uh, like I said earlier, the love of money is the root of all evil. And, uh, but he was willing to sell Christ. We know what that was. It was 30 pieces of silver, uh, which would not have ever retired him. In those days, he'd have been fairly well off, but uh, it wouldn't have been perfect. It kind of reminds you uh, the amulets chasing lawyers of the day. They tell you about these big, big things they do for you and recover a lot of money uh, when they're really only interested in fattening their own pockets, and uh, that's why they do what they do. Um, but he was only interested in what he could get out of this. I just can't believe, um, you know, in my mind, because I believe in, in Jesus Christ, I'm a child of his, how anyone could walk right beside him and be in the very presence of God's Son Himself and see the miracles done and could not be converted. It, you know, just could not could be converted. Um, he probably could have, but he never was going to be. Uh, it wasn't that God demanded that he couldn't be, but God knows everything. He knows the beginning and the end. He, he knew this one right here would never be converted. Uh, and... Sadly to say, could you imagine him loving on him just like he loved on the rest of them? He shared with them. He defended them uh, as he did the others. So um, while knowing that Christ did that, he had, he had to love us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. Now, he died for him as well. But uh, nevertheless, it didn't do him no good. We find out after it was over with that he went out and hanged himself. Uh, he couldn't live with the very fact. You know, I think that... Uh, the, he even tried to give the money back. It wasn't a, it got to be where it wasn't no money. He got the money in his hand. Jesus gets arrested. He's going to be crucified. And and then I think guilt. He going out. What, what, this man didn't deserve this. He he didn't deserve this. And I sold him. I sold him out to him. And uh, but nevertheless, they wouldn't take it back. It was blood money. So they wouldn't. They hadn't. Didn't want no part of it. Imagine that. They would. They wouldn't dare touch that because it was blood money, but yet they would kill the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But uh, we know why. In verse 6 he says, And he promised and sought opportunity to betray him unto them in the absence of the multitude. There again we see the politics, the public, uh, play a big part in that. He would, he would talk with them. And find out when, when Jesus and the disciples or Jesus was not around uh, the public people, not around the multitudes of people, and he would tip them off where he was at and they could come in and do what they did. And once, of course, they get him arrested, uh, he's kind of behind closed doors and uh, they could do what they want to with him. But uh, the sneaky kind of way, and my friend, I'll tell you, that's what Satan does. He, he, he really couldn't face a, a good Christian face-to-face -face and do anything. He wants to trick you. He wants to woo you into doing something and, instead of hitting you face-to-face -face with it. And he can cause a lot of problems. But this is how the effect that he had um, on, the, on the rest of Jesus Christ. 
Verse 7 goes on to say this. It says, Then came the day of the unleavened bread when the Passover must be killed. So they were preparing to do um, uh, the sacrifice and all on this special day uh, when the Lord, uh, the blood of the Lamb, uh, saved the people, the children of Israel while they was in Egypt. They were, it was that day they were fixing to do that. And then Peter, in verse uh, 8, it says, And he sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare us the Passover that we may eat. Now notice that um, it, it's kind of like Christmas is celebrated uh, kind of worldwide, but in each individual household. And that's kind of the way they were doing the Passover. It was that day they was in the place they needed to be. And he tells Peter, he says, you go and prepare the Passover. But now he, they didn't have a house. They didn't have a sanctuary that was called theirs. But they were traveling. Uh, they were missionaries going all over the place. So they had to have a place to stay. And uh, Peter comes to that recognition in verse 10. He says, and, uh, and they said unto him in verse 9, he says, where wilt thou that we prepare it. So where do we need to go? Notice what he says. This is amazing how God's way ahead and how, how God has uh, had an effect, Jesus had an effect on people that these guys didn't know that he, they even knew them. It says, and he said unto them, he says, Behold, he said, when you enter into the city, there shall be a, there shall be a man meet you bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he entereth in. He says, and, and ye shall say unto the good man of the house, The master saith unto thee, Where is the guest chamber? Where shall I eat the Passover with my disciples? There's a prepared man. Now, you know, he wouldn't be a popular person because you know that uh, the Sanhedrin and, and all were out to kill Christ, but yet he was fixing to allow him to use his house to entertain the disciples uh, there to celebrate the Passover, and it was all prepared. You know, um, the, the things what amazed me is just like when uh, Jesus sent him in there to get the cold of an ass to come, and he come riding in on Palm Sunday, and he, he come riding in and crying Hosanna that, that that colt was prepared, and the man just let him have it. God was working in people's heart. Sometimes we don't uh, realize that God works and sets the stage for us. As we move through today, God's got people planted in places and situations planted in places for us to uh, uh, encounter. And uh, we, if we fail not to do, do, do stuff when God did, then we just miss the blessing. Uh, but sometimes we realize what we're there for and we are, we become a blessing to someone else. So he, he lines out the way. So this man, when they said the master, uh, they didn't have to elaborate anymore because this man was already prepared. Uh, he said, where is that? And they carried him to what they call the guest chamber. Now, this man is, uh, Jesus is going to be a guest of this man's house. And uh, I hope he's a guest in your house as much as he was in this house. It was a one-time stop. Maybe he goes there and verse 12 says, and he, showed, and he shall show you a large upper room furnished there make ready. Now, they didn't have to prepare the room. This room was ready before they got there. They were preparing the Passover uh, offering. Uh, they were preparing the, the lamb and, uh, and uh, preparing the celebration of the Passover. And in verse 13, it says, because Jesus was telling them verbatim what they'll find in 13 says, and they went and found as he had, he had said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. Now, you think about all these things. What tremendous faith was this that these guys demonstrated that they go and they see this man. Uh, you know, there wasn't four or five men meet, greeting them or meeting them uh, coming into the city with a pitcher of water. You know, I think that was pretty much defined. You see a man. Why is that so different? Well, normally you wouldn't see the men bearing a pot of water. The women bared the pots of water in those days, and they would go to the well at certain times of the day. They would gather the water. They would bring it in and uh, use it for the cooking, the cleaning, and the whole thing. And, and it was kind of that uh, it would be a standout. Well, there's a man with a pitcher of water. There's no other guy around here. That, no, that's him. Beyond a shadow of a doubt, that's him. That's, that's who I'm supposed to see. And he carried them. And notice, I don't even think they had conversation with the man. They, they followed him to his house. And then when they got there, 
he told them the master had need of this place. And so he showed them uh, the guest chamber. And so it was so in verse 13. And there they are uh, preparing for the Passover. In verse 14 it says, And when the hour was come, he sat down uh, and the twelve apostles with him. And he said unto them, He said, With desire I have, I have desired to eat the Passover with you before I suffer. Now, uh, that was probably somewhat disturbing. I think they, they got bits and pieces, but they didn't maybe know that it was right now. It was fixing to happen before their eyes. He was um, uh, telling them this would be the last time he would eat with them. It would be the last time that they could gather and do those things. Uh, so he said that he had a, a, a desire. He said, I've been wanting to do this for a long time. You know, and he also said in the scriptures that that's why he was sent. He had to do the will of the Father. That's why he was sent to do this very thing. He says, and I, with, much, with desire, I have desired to eat this Passover before I suffer. He says, for I say unto you, I will not uh, any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. What was it? Well, it was the death of him and the resurrection. That's what, that's what it was here. And uh, um, probably they could not, just like we can't, we can't visualize um, heaven, uh, all the things there are, but our mind could not contain it. And uh, they, they probably, even in their imaginations, didn't know it was going to go as, as cruel as it did go, but yet Jesus went on anyway when he had the power to stop all those things. But he told them, he says, uh, this will be the last time. He says, till it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. He says, and he took the cup and gave thanks and said, he says, take this and divide it amongst yourselves. Now, something kind of to remind you of, they, they're there celebrating the, the Passover and right it's going to flow right into the Lord's Supper. Uh, but they're actually going to have a feast. They're going to have a meal, and they did because it says, For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And then in 19 it goes, it says, And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body in which was given for you. This do, and remember it weeds. It says, And likewise also the cup after, after the supper. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. So, the, 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 the meal was probably not uh, anything that they had ever done like before because um, he was instituting here what we know as the Lord's Supper, but yet it was the feast for them. But yet I believe as he broke the bread and began to talk about it and he, they passed it out among themselves and, and they passed the cup out among themselves and, and they were doing all that and it was just kind of coming... Um, to a head at one time, and uh, I, I guess you could say maybe they bumped one and said, we never done it like this before. You know, we never did it like this before. There's, you know, this is kind of eerie how we're doing this. Normally, we know we just do it, and, and it's done, and we're out of here. But now, he said that, uh, he said, this cup is the New Testament of my blood, which is shed for you. So he's already talking about his blood, dying on the cross, what his blood would do for them. And in and 21, we won't go a whole bunch further here, but it says in 21, he says, But behold, the hand of him that betrayeth me is with me on the table. He says, And truly the Son of Man goeth as it is determined, but woe unto that man by whom he shall is, he is betrayed. Uh, you think about that. Judas is sitting here and listening to this, knowing the power of God uh, through Jesus Christ and uh, he's sitting there, and he's shouting out a warning signal to him. He says, Be beware of this man. Woe is he that does this, that betrays God. I believe you could honestly say that today. Uh, those that betray Jesus Christ, well, it's going to be a, nothing but a, a, a bad ending for anyone that does those things. And there Judas was uh, sitting there. He had partaken of the bread. You know, I think about that sometimes when we, we have communion. Uh, I need myself to be right. I need everyone else to be right. And, and we do those things. And, and people do it because maybe uh, they wouldn't want someone to see them not do it in church. Well, I got news for you. If your heart is not clean and it is not right, it'd be best for you to pass on and not take of it. The Bible tells us that 
um, that is very dangerous grounds that you, you defile the communion of the Lord uh, and none of us are worthy other than by the blood of Jesus Christ but uh, just say you're sitting in, in the midst and there's a lot of things in your life that you hadn't got right with God and you partake of that you're in danger, in danger of the judgment according to the word of God not my word and I'm not judging anybody because I don't know that situation but it is, it is for pastors and preachers and teachers and prophets to tell those things to people to warn them because it could turn into a sickness unto death. And uh, so you need to be very careful, or we need to be very careful uh, at that time. And uh, so uh, he, t- he talks about him, and in verse 23 he says, And they begin to inquire among themselves which of them it should be to do this thing. And he says, and there was also strife among them, which of them should be accounted the greatest. Could you imagine all that going on at one time? Jesus says one of these guys is going to rat us out. And uh, he's going he's gonna to turn their back on me and he's going to turn me in. He's going to do all that. And then as the flow goes in there, if he leaves, who's going to be in charge? In, in that, uh, you know, in business, you know, I think that, that they call that the line of aggression. Uh, you know, who's going to take whose place if, if someone moves on? Well, uh, no one is going to take Jesus' spot. He's, he, he's, he might die on the cross, but he's going to rise again, and no one can take his place. He's going to sit on the right hand of the Father, but yet they were worried about who amongst them would be the greatest, which one would be uh, the chief and all like that. Of course, if they went by seniority, you would look at Peter maybe, but yet Peter's fixing to deny him and uh, were their hearts and all that. They was more concerned about who was going to, be president or the leader he said here he he said to them he says the kings of the gentiles exercise lordship over them and they exercise authority upon them are called benefactors but ye shall not be so but ye he that is greatest among you let him be as the younger and he is that is chief as as he that doth serve so he, he said, if y'all want to figure out who it is, it's the one that uh, the most dedicated, the one that works the hardest, the one that uh, stays lowly, the one that uh, goes about doing good and, and doing all the things that I meant. That's the one that will be there. It's a way to um, uh, lead by example. He said, that's who will be in charge. He says, for whether, for, in verse 27, he says, for whether is greater he that sitteth at meat or he that serveth, is, is not he that sitteth at meat, but, but I am among you as he that serveth. He, he's trying to tell them, he says, y'all, y'all looking at me as the leader here and all like that. He said, but yet look at the situation. I'm serving you. The pastor and the deacon serves the congregation. We are servants to you guys. You know, we're, we're, you're serving. Jesus is telling them, he says, if y'all looking at all that, look now, I'm, you know, I, I actually humble myself. If anything, be like uh, John the Baptist when he come to him to baptize him. He said, oh, Lord, I can't baptize you. You need to baptize me. And he said, no, suffer it to be. Allow it to happen. It has to happen. And you, you just happen to be the guy. And uh, so the example he set before them is what he's reminding them of. In verse 28, he says, Ye are they which, are, which have continued with me in my temptations. And I appoint you unto you a kingdom as my Father has appointed unto me, that ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. He said, I'm not leaving anybody out. You know, in the kingdom of God, Everybody wants to know who's going to be where and how they're going to do this and that and the other. And the Bible describes some of those things, how it's going to be. But here he's telling them, he says, I'm going to sit on the right hand of, of the Father, and you guys are going to sit up there with me and judge the tribes. Now, that's pretty awesome. You, you think about that. So they're judging the people in the past, in the present, and in the future. They was wondering where they will be sitting. Well, we, we know there, there's, there's 12 gates that's going to be in the city. We know there's, there's 12 tribes that's going to be up there, and all there's a lot of important people there, a lot, of, a lot of numbers juggling about this and that and the other going to be up there. But I, I tell you, my friends, the apostles has play, will play a special uh, part 
and uh, their arrangement and where God's going to have them proportionally done. If they're apostles and they, he called them to be disciples, followers, and then they become apostles upon accepting him and walking with the Lord, we also uh, are disciples of God now. But when Jesus resurrects us or we die to go see him, however it may be, we step into apostleship at that moment because then we're qualified because we'll see the Lord face to face. That's the difference. The sad thing is we're, going, we're talking about one guy really tonight that walked amongst it, acted like them, dressed like them, even partook of things of heavenly places and d- took of heavenly things and, and may have even prayed. Who knows? Just because a man uttered a word of prayer don't mean he's born again. He done all those things, but Christ still loving him and treating him no different to this point. And later on, when we study a little bit further, as, as we cr- cr- closely progress to Easter, he'll, he'll come out and say in other Gospels, he says, that what you must do, do quickly. It's time for you to go, boy. It's time for you to leave. They all know who it is. You know who it is. Now you go on. Why did he want him to do it quickly? Well, some thinks that the suffering began in, in the garden, and now I may even preach that myself. But really, the suffering, as these days gotten closer to this point right here, the suffering, the agony inside of Christ's mind already began. Not that he wasn't going to follow through with it, but the time was at hand. He said, now just get on out here and go do what you got to do. Just get on out and go do what you got to do. It's kind of like, kind of ill-like. Just go on and do what you got to do. And he turned his back and he sold him for 30 pieces of silver. And he, he worked with that. You know, Jesus even said, he says, the one whose hand is betray me is doing it right at now as I speak. He knew he was there. He knew he was selling him at that moment. So he knows everything about us. But when we think about what Christ did for us and what we do uh, and how we live, we're undeserving. But go, I'm so glad he's merciful. I'm so glad he forgive, He has forgiveness. I'm so glad he loved us in spite of the things that we'll do even after we become saved. But he made a way through his son, through his blood, that we could have eternal life through him, through all this. So as we start gearing up to get to the resurrection, you know, um, it's kind of like as close as you might can think about it if you think about sports. If there's one second left on the clock and you got to kick a field goal to win or if you miss it, you lose, and the guy kicks it and he makes it from 60 yards out and everybody just goes crazy and all like that, that's not even close to what it should be like when we remember what Jesus done for us on the resurrection day. Could you imagine seeing and hearing the story from the women that went down there, the excitement that they win and says, come see, they've took away our Lord, they've done all this. And then one of them goes up there and tells them disciples, he said, hey, I'm telling you, he's coming. He says, you gather up here, he's alive. I saw him myself. And some of them go, you must be crazy. Have you been drinking too much wine? You've been in the communion box a little heavy. No, she saw him and she was that way. And we could be excited that way too. Every, every time we draw another breath, it's not our air we breathe, it's his. And we've got a future. What to look forward to? We ain't looking forward to whatever's going on in Ukraine and all like that. Our further shot, our, our eyes need to be cast so far ahead. We're looking for the kingdom of God to return to the earth to gather his children home. And what a day that will be. When our Jesus we shall see. When we look upon his face, the one that saved us by his grace. When he takes us by our hands and he leads us through the promised land, what a day, what a day that'll be. What a glorious day that will be. So think on them things as we prepare for Easter. And if that were us and all the opportunities he had to slip away and go away, he chose not to. He could have said, Lord, they've turned me in, and I just not know. He went on and done it anyway. He loved us that much. That's an unconditional love that's hard for even man to comprehend. 
Why would somebody do that? You know, if I could say anything to a lost person tonight, whether we deserved it or not, he loved you more than anybody else alive. Your mama, your daddy, your grandma, whatever, loved you more than them that he laid down his life for you. What could you say? I'm not going to say what would you say because you don't know what you're going to say. But what could you say when you face that man face to face and you know you never made things right, you never asked for forgiveness? What could you say? I'll tell you your answer. You can say nothing. But it's too late. So remember that, I pray. Y'all have a good week. I think it warmed up this afternoon. A little wet around places, but hey, it's a good day. One good thing we see out of it is my wife keeps asking me about the pollen. That rain did knock that pollen down a good bit, and I know all of, all, all the ones that have the, it bothers my eyes and some of y'all's nose is worse than others and all like that, but ain't God good. When I thought that we had a, a, a fire somewhere in our neighborhood, and I got to looking and got the nose, and Jen come home the other day, I says, was that pollen? She says, it was pollen, that thick. It wasn't that way this morning. It was as clear as it could be. Ain't God good, ain't he? Let's pray. Father, we thank you, God, for being so good to us. God, as we rehearse the words and the steps that you took on your way to the cross, God, it just wells within our hearts to know you loved us that way. And, God, we don't want to never not be thankful. Never take that for granted, what you do for us. This life may not be peaches and cream, but God, it's glorious and, and, and full of joy and happiness because we know whatever this life's over, we can be with you throughout eternity. And that's what we live for. God, go with us now. Keep us all safe when we go home. Continue to bless those that, Lord, have procedures and are sick and treatments and all the things that's going on. Be with them in a mighty way. In Jesus' name, amen.